great and uh, very thoughtful of you to sponsor this program which i think is a very topical and a very important program and uh, it's my privilege to welcome roxana who i know for several years and uh, i'm just going to formally introduce her because uh, you know every cardiologist especially interventional cardiologist has you know knows this name roxana mehran and especially you know anybody who has done any reading on uh, stent from stent uh, restenosis or any work on acute kidney injury following die injection which is you know known to us and higher classification are you know historic she is currently the professor of medicine and director of interventional cardiology research at the very well known mount sinai uh, hospital in new york and needless to say she is very widely published and uh, one of her uh, recent works was the twilight study in which i had the honor of uh, working with her as a national lead investigator for india and you know that this was presented as a late breaking trial in tct 2018 and also came simultaneously in new england journal of medicine and then various other analysis diabetic subset and you know many other subsets are uh, getting published several of them have got published and uh, you know she is also the course director of the very well known program tct and we're just discussing about that so with that i think i would request uh, roxana to talk about one of the very well known trials the freedom trial is it still relevant roxana please Thank you, Professor Call, uh, and my dear colleagues, and uh, uh, USV for inviting me to speak today, and especially in regards to the uh, Freedom Trial, which really is a focus on a very, very important epidemic that is global, and that's diabetes, and understanding how best to treat our patients with coronary disease and diabetes is paramount. So, thank you for having me. It's important for you to uh, note my disclosures with regard to diabetes. I do not have uh, any particular uh, disclosures, and I was not did not receive payment for this uh, talk. It's important for you to note that. But I do receive uh, specifically, especially speaking about the Twilight study, which was um, uh, uh, sponsored by the ICANN School of Medicine, but with a grant from AstraZeneca. Well, coronary disease um, in diabetic patients is truly an epidemic, and the epidemiology is massive. And if you think about the numbers, they're staggering. 15% of adult patients have diabetes mellitus. 55% of adult diabetic patients have coronary disease, and they usually start at a younger age women are affected as often as men and the younger women really do have a horrible prognosis and it's very very important to understand the um the impact of this uh uh horrific uh situation where you're seeing it basically prevalent around the world and you see it uh quite prevalent obviously in in India and in Asia and in Southeast Asia Coronary disease and diabetes has important differences than non-diabetic patients. There's more severe. Here's a non-diabetic patient, and here's a diabetic patient, and really you can see the differential and how it's so different. More severe, more diffuse disease, smaller vessels. They present with um, with uh, silent ischemia. There's usually autonomic dysfunction. There's also some. uh diabetic cardiomyopathy that's associated with uh diabetes where there is ventricular dilation and dysfunction and two to four fold higher morbidity mortality um in these patients and it's important to understand that diabetes affects the entire ecosystem of of uh coronary disease at, in whole that and it really does have a very very um uh important pathological processes where there's overlap of inflammation prothrombotic state intimal hyperplasia a very high atherosclerotic burden 
uh, which um, and endothelial dysfunction that has been well documented. And then, of course, there's this cardiometabolic syndrome in our diabetic patients, including uh, renal dysfunction and an important LV dysfunction that leads to CAD progression and worsening prognosis of these patients after revascularization. What evidence do we have in our patients for revascularization of maybe cabbage versus PCI? And the Freedom Study was the largest study ever, but the earlier evidence, um, the Berry trial, which looked at cabbage versus PCI very, very early on and with more than five years follow-up. In patients with diabetes, there's been a very good uh, evidence now that cardiovascular mortality is, was favoring uh, coronary artery bypass surgery. And it's an important understanding to, to, to note that when we perform PCI, we treat the target lesion, but these patients with diabetes have multiple lesions and can have new lesions forming outside of the stent. And it is important to note that possibly in, in, in a lot of the cases, uh, coronary artery bypass surgery could be superior in that it bypasses the entire vessel and protects the patient. And it could very well be possible that that's the case. And we have tried to better understand because our patients are very reluctant to that kind of um, uh, uh, aggressive uh, revascularization with cabbage. And we've also noted that uh, uh, in, in patients with diabetes and multiple arterial grafts, that there is higher rates of infection with double mammaries, for example. And if we want to do the best things for our patients, perhaps we need to figure out who best is going to have which uh, therapeutic strategy. And in PERI 2D, when cabbage or PCI or medical therapy was evaluated in diabetic patients in stable PCI, it was very important to note that um, the cabbage um, uh, uh, the cabbage um, uh, superiority was really over over medical therapy and uh, and also PCI was in really in those patients with a higher syntax score. And so it's important that we have a very good understanding that there's no question, uh, that the syntax um, uh, study, which was a very, very large study of a PCI strategy uh, versus cabbage in patients with multivessel disease, and we found that both diabetes and the syntax score really pushed the patients to the edge of the higher risk patients, higher MACE uh, rates, higher death rates, and higher target lesion revascularization. And when we pull the analysis from syntax pre-combat and the best trials, it's really interesting to see that there are ways that we could risk stratify patients with a syntax score of greater than 33. Those patients should have PCI. And in the uh, lower syntax score, there is equipoise and we need to kind of evaluate that. Well, the Freedom Study was the largest study designed for diabetic patients. Everything else I talked to you about, we're not just in diabetic patients. And in Freedom, which was a uh, superiority trial, um, diabetic patients with multivessel disease, cabbage versus PCI with a drug-eluting stent, first generation, um, there was a, 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 a wonderful randomization of about 1,900 patients in 140 sites. And my, uh, my um, mentor, Dr. Fuster, led this trial and Dr. Farku uh, presented this in the New England Journal of Medicine, looking at the major adverse cardiac events of death, non-fatal amine, and non-fatal stroke. The first time we're looking at heart endpoints instead of the revascularization coming in. These were um, patients who were, um, you know, had uh, hemoglobin A1Cs pretty high up there, um, 15, 16% current smokers, 25% with prior MI, 30% uh, or so with a recent acute coronary syndrome. And for the most part, for the most part, they had three vessel disease. This is a, a very, very um, high risk patient population. And if you look at their syntax score, the, the mean syntax score was about 26. So really fitting in that, in that region of intermediate and high risk being sort of the majority of these patients, 
and about 35% with the low risk. So an ability to look across those important syntax scores. Well, if you look at the um, hard endpoint of death and MI or stroke over the period of um, up to five years, you start to see the separation of the curves around one and a half years or so for this hard endpoint in favor of cabbage. And this was durable across up to five years. And especially knowing that with that came also a higher rate of revascularization. With a much longer term follow-up out to eight years, this, um, this benefit of cabbage over PCI remained uh, durable. And so all-cause mortality was still lower in cabbage compared to PCI. And when you look at um, the syntax score, um, there was an independent risk for PCI, but not in cabbage. But regardless of the syntax score, it's important to note that even though the higher syntax score patients did worse with PCI, the benefit of cabbage was across all of the syntax scores compared to PCI. And this was not, the P interaction was negative for a syntax score. And in insulin-related, uh, insulin-treated diabetics, these patients, there was no interaction for um, improvement of cabbage versus PCI. Cabbage was superior even in insulin-dependent PCI. So the big question that comes back to us when we have a large trial like that is that, is this still relevant? Well, it's still valid that, that uh, there's no question that Freedom showed us that there's, it's really important to have guideline-directed medical therapy and control of the risk factors, and they tried very hard to do that. They showed that you need DAPT for 12 months with aspirin and clopidogrel, and they use arterial grafts as much as possible. But now we have a lot more since the FREEDOM trial. First of all, in FREEDOM, the compliance and goals for medical management of these patients were absolutely not met. Even though they did their best to have a higher level of compliance, the goals for treatment of diabetes and hypertension was not really met. 60% of the patients still were not on complete guideline-directed therapies. Certainly, these was, uh, the, this trial was on first-generation drug-eluting stents, and I'll show you some of the data with prolonged dual antiplatelet therapies. Of course, we have a lot more newer generation DAPT with shorter duration of, of dual antiplatelet therapy, and now we have much, much better treatment for hyper, hyperglycemia with SGLT2 receptor inhibitors, and which was never, ever used. So first-generation DES, absolutely well known that there is an important um, delayed uh, endothelialization, hypersensitivity reactions due to ne neoatherosclerosis, as well as aneurysm formation and stent thrombosis. So the pooled analysis for the first generation DES is absolutely there for uh, a higher event rates in terms of myocardial infarction and stent thrombosis. And when you compare that to the current generation, there's no question that the current generation is even better than bare metal stents. And we have thinner struts, better metallic alloy with cobalt chromium, much better biocompatible polymers, floral polymers, and also biodegradable or absent polymers, and a wonderful, adequate drug release kinetics that has been in the innovative approaches of the current generation DES. So, and furthermore, we know that the new era has brought less restenosis, late stent less late stent thrombosis, and a much, much better result. Bioresorbable scaffolds pulled us back, but, but right now with current generation, metallic DES, we're doing extremely well. And we are fairly focusing on improving our PCI techniques with IVIS and OCT leading to improving our procedural results and late outcomes. So there's much less under expansion, much less uh, untreated dissections or hematomas and improving the outcomes of PCI with imaging, especially in these diffusely diseased uh, vessels in our diabetic patients. And we have next generation DES showing its really great value 
in diabetic patients. The Tuxedo trial in India was a prospective trial multi-center that included diabetic patients, and it was ever all a saluting stent or the first generation paclitaxel stent and showed fantastic, fantastic reductions of target vessel failure and TLR. And this was a really, it continues to show us that this kind of improvement in the DES technology has led to improving outcomes in diabetic patients. And we continue to build on the best DES technology now with uh, uh, Concept Medical, which is a company based in India with an abluminous DES designed for treatment of diabetic patients, where the, the abluminous DES carries the drug on the abluminal surface of the stent. And very importantly, the drug is applied after the stent is crimped on the balloon. So the balloon as well carries um, uh, the, the drug, not just around the surface with a uniform distribution of the drug, but also on the edges where we see a lot of restenosis. And we really believe that this could have an, an important, with this nanotechnology, could have an important outcome. Uh, and the only way to do this is by randomizing. You've seen that. You can't just claim you're better without doing a large prospective randomized study of, against the best in class. And this company has come forth and said, we will do this. And what they're doing is looking at diabetic patients with 3,000 patients in the Ability Diabetes randomized clinical trial that I have the pleasure of having uh, being on the executive committee led by... Um, um, uh, our colleagues, uh, uh, Antonio Colombo and Alex Abazide in randomizing patients with, uh, in, uh, with diabetes who are amenable to PCI to um, abluminous DES versus PCI with uh, the Zion stent. Marie-Claude Maurice at Cirque is leading the uh, clinical coordinating center. We are the statistical analysis center, and we hope to deliver this very, very soon. We've begun enrollment now uh, globally, and we'll bring this very soon to the United States. There's also the CREATE study, the CREATE trial, uh, the stent, which is a, 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 another stent that has a, an interesting uh, profile of uh, using uh, amphilomous uh, eluding um, a drug Cream, but now we have so much more to offer than we did 12 or 15 years ago. So the big question that comes here, and I quote uh, Sripal Bangalore, my dear YU, it is foolish to ignore the results of freedom and the freedom all follow on trials, equally foolish to ignore the wealth of data supporting clear impact on death and MI with improvement in medical therapies and our stent technologies. I couldn't say it any better than that. And I so thank you for your attention. And I look forward to hearing uh, Professor Call in his rebuttal or his, his <laughs> counterpoint to my lecture. Thank you again. Thank you very much, Roxana. And this is not a debate. And we're going to compliment each other. So may I request uh, uh, my friend, Dr. Yadav, to take over and uh, continue the session. Well, thanks a lot, uh, Professor Paul, and uh, good evening to you, ladies and gentlemen. Next time, we're going to present to you none other than Professor Upendra Paul. We all know him. He's a mentor to a lot of interventional cardiologists in this country, a Padm Shri and a BC Roy National Awardee, and he was an ex-professor at the All India Institute of Medical Sciences and currently serves as the chairman and the dean of academic and medical research 
at the Batra Hospital and Research Center in Delhi. He was also a principal investigator of the trial which just Dr. Mehran referred to, the Tuxedo India published in New England Journal of Medicine, and n number of trials. And I think I'll be just, I can go on for, for eternity. I'll probably hand over the mic to him. So over to you. Thank you. Thank you very much. And let me, let me share my screen. So here I am. And let me, let me. Okay, now uh, I'm going to talk about in the next 12 or 15 minutes about that we need to relook at the role of PCI in diabetics with multivessel disease and Roxana also towards the end was coming to it. And diabetes is a, you know, we call it the diabetic capital of the world. And I'm not, uh, you know, exaggerating if I say that one in three patients who come to our cath lab for a PCI has diabetes mellitus, and that is a fact. And we also know, as Roxana showed, that diabetes is associated with a lot more complex disease, diffuse atherosclerosis, uh, you know, which needs, uh, has many complications, even if the patient is a surgical patient, you know, there's infections and diffuse disease, having hardly any place to put in grafts and dartrectomies, and everything which Dr. Yadov knows very well. But the clinical observations made during the last 25 years have suggested that diabetics have suboptimal outcomes after any kind of revascularization, especially PCI. And these are some of the uh, important trials, and one of them is in tax in which uh, the number of diabetics were 452, and there one can very clearly say there was a clear-cut superior outcomes in terms of mortality in the surgical arm, and also in the freedom, like the freedom study once again, it was sort of very clearly shown that uh, the death, all-cause death, the cardiovascular death was clearly much, much uh, lower in patients who underwent bypass surgery. And results of freedom trial actually have become, you know, in the mind of everybody. And it has actually undermined the role of angioplasty in diabetics with multivessel disease. We know that. And any ethics committee where you present triple vessel disease and then they come out with this trial, is it ethical to conduct this trial? And the meta-analysis done, you know, a year after the freedom results were analyzed, it showed again that if you combine freedom, syntax, cardia, VK, VA cards,
40 to 50 percent to 24 to 36 percent. Then the first generation drug eluting stint cipher in Texas, about 20 to 29 percent. And then you come to the article which I just quoted, it's become, you know, mortality has become not significantly different between the two. So this is very important point. And that is the reason now, today, bypass surgery continues to be class one indication in multivessel disease. But if the syntax score is less, less than 33, and here it is less than 22, which are, you know, simpler cases, uh, angioplasty is now a 2A, which has been upgraded. So evidence and guidelines clearly in more complex cases favors bypass surgery. But you see that angioplasty continues to be performed in spite of the evidence to contrary, and Dr. Yado knows that. What are the drawbacks of tri you know, the trials which we compared bypass surgery and angioplasty? And Roxana very clearly mentioned that. First of all, early generation stents in both these big trials. Low rates of FFR, IFR, and now we have QFR, where you don't need to put in a guide wire into the vessel. Lower rates of uh, IVERS and uh, OCT for OPC, PCI optimization. And then complete revascularization has been lower. 50 to 57 to 65% in syntax, pre-combat and best, these three big studies. And then the inappropriate use of optimal medical therapy post-revascularization period. What has been the impact of newer generation drug eluting stents? You can see that new generation stents have challenged the supremacy of bypass surgery. And then adjunct therapy is extremely important. More potent antiplatelet agents like prasugrel, ticagrelor, IV cangrelor at the time you're doing the PCI if you're not sure about the antiplatelet you know, therapy on board. Then we have ultra thin strut drug eluting stents. And we have bioresorbable polymers, polymer free drug eluting stent platforms. And uh, Roxana showed the slide from Renu Virmani regarding all the advantages of these less inflammation, you know, less neointimal hyperplasia. And these all are expected to improve the repeat revascularization rates as well as possibly survival if you take all the things in complex PCI treated with new generation drug eluting stents. Importance of OMT cannot be underemphasized. She already mentioned about SGLT2 inhibitors. We can also talk about GLP-1 analogs, which you can give in patients who already have had vascular events. They act on the, uh, they act on the, you know, atherosclerotic process. SGLT2 are basically hemodynamic things and, you know, start acting very early, reduce heart failure. And now you must know that syntax trial optimal medical treatment use was associated with better outcome. If you do a subset analysis of syntax trial, you would see that optimal medical treatment in the PCI arm was being done in close to 50%. Any antiplatelet, antiplatelets were used much more often in the PCI arm, but statins, you see, 75, 78, 80%. And in the surgical arm, just, uh, you know, 75 in the first few months, and then it drops down to 60%, which is uh, not desirable. And as a result of it, if you take the subset of patients who had optimal medical treatment, you would see that the deaths at one month, six months, one year is significantly lower. At three years also, it is lower. At five years, it is also lower. And if you look at death, MI, and CVA, once again, you see it all the time intervals, it is better. So optimal medical therapy is one of the key, uh, you know, in this era, which we always emphasize. And about the ultra low strut thickness stents, once again, a meta-analysis of Sripal Bangalore, in which he has taken all the stents less than 70 millimicrons. And he showed that there were better results, lower TLF, especially because of lower myocardial infarction, lower stent thrombosis, and there was no difference in the state types in the metamorphosis. And this you can see, all the stents which he took in the analysis 
you can see all the or zero stands sort out six you can see the me stand you can see the indian biomime stand and if you do the meta analysis you see that 16% lower target lesion failure in this meta analysis which favors ultra thin uh, drug eluting stents new generation versus first generation drug eluting stent already known uh, you know about the tuxedo india study which showed clearly that uh, zines was better than taxes element and that was the time when people were trying to say that paclitaxel is a very good molecule for diabetics not for others and we showed in a uh, in a very important trial uh, that it is not the so zines is not only non inferior it is superior talent once again a study in which uh, i chaired it with uh, uh, professor sarais in which the composite endpoint of doshe was at the end of one year similar although the number of diabetics is only 23.5 years and the talent at two years once again shows that there is a numerical advantage to in this indian stent supraflex 6.9% versus 7.9% 1% difference 12.6% reduction if you look at this esr test once again a meta analysis in which uh, you can choice which is a stent uh, without a polymer and if you look at zines they have similar results whereas if you look at cipher you see that may say 10 years is 55% whereas may say 10 years is clearly significantly lower when the polymer is either a durable polymer like a fluoropolymer of zines or you have no polymer and then you have this bioflow two at five years very clearly showing that zines 12.7% and or zero 10.4% once again more than 2% absolute difference and what about the results with new generation drug eluting stents including ultra low strut thickness uh, drug eluting stents in diabetics multi vessel disease unfortunately we don't have a data and that is the reason we started this tuxedo to india trial which is the results of ultra thin strut biodegradable polymer stent Oh, uh, I, I know we'll get with drug eluting stent designs in a high risk population with diabetics and multi vessel disease. This has never been studied. Of course, we'll take all those patients who are revascularizable, taking the heart team criteria. Surgeon also says yes, we can also revascularize all. You can also. The results of freedom therefore needs to have a reappraisal, and the objective of our trial is to give clarity. to the influence of new generation drug eluting stent including the ultra thin drug eluting stent in diabetics with multi vessel disease and we are going to compare it with bypass surgery results based upon the performance goal analysis of the freedom trial which was done in 2012 and uh, you know so uh, sripal bangro is the co pi and i am the national lead investigator this is the stent indian stent supraflex cruz which is 60 millimicron stent material is chromium cobalt uh, it is cerulemus and biodegradable polymers it comes in all the lengths and the uh, diameter is up to 4.5 and we'll be comparing it with the zines family of stents as we know that zines stent has not changed over the years it is only the platforms which have changed better platforms have come like expedition and uh, the newer platforms they are easily deliverable the stent is the same and this is the tuxedo 2 trial and as i told you sripal is the co-chair we're going to have 1800 patients randomized one is to one between supraflex screws and zines the primary objective being comparing the two stents with the primary endpoint of target lesion failure at one year and then this pooled data of both the stents we are going to compare with the performance goal analysis as compared to what the freedom study had we also have the second arm in which we're going to have ticagrelor versus prasugrel as one of the studies done from the german heart institute published showed that prasugrel is better than ticagrelor so we're going to have 1800 patients more in the esr test uh, you know cohort like and show that is one better than the other 
case example of Hotaxido 2, we have already started this study. Basically, patients should be on medical treatment for diabetes. Angioplasty will be done using high pressure post tent dilatation. And IOS imaging is desirable, not in all 1800 patients because it's very expensive and we can't force people. And stents, one is to one, supraflex versus Zions. I already told you Tachygrelor or Presigrel randomized. ECG clinical follow up at one month, six months, 12 months. And then follow up these patients for five years because the difference between stent and bypass surgery results in freedom started showing after two years, 2.5 years. So we're going to go up to five years. And our aim is to keep LDL cholesterol less than 55 using high dose of statins, azitimibe, and PCSK9 wherever required. And HbA1c around seven, encouraging the use of SGLT2 and GLP1 wherever it's required. And this is some of the uh, first two cases. This is, you can see the diabetic vessel, a right coronary artery. You can see long segment disease. And this is after angioplasty. And uh, very good result, at least for the short term. And this is the same patient. You can see the circumflex long diffuse disease and LAD uh, ulcerated mid-segment lesion near the uh, origin of this septal vessel. Following angioplasty, you can see we have been able to cross the wire with difficulty and got two stents in. And you can see the result looks good. And post-pressure, high-pressure dilatation done with bigger balloons. And this is the LED result. You can see that. And this we already seen. Case number two, you can see that right coronary artery distally is disease, but FFR of PDA and PLV is uh, normal. And you can see the circumflex, again an FFR, which is showing that it's flow limiting. LED has a very distal lesion, but this diagonal very large diagonal has a significant post osteal disease. And uh, this is the circumflex. This is the diagonal after putting in a stent. And that is the LED distally. Uh, this also stented. So complete revascularization done. And so timelines for Tuxedo 2, actually because of the COVID, it slowed down. We started in February. We have already recruited 30 patients, and we expect that last case enrollment should be there by June 2021, last follow-up by June 2021. One-year data should be available by 30th July 2022, and if Roxana accepts, we should be presenting it at the TCT 2022, hopefully. Thank you very much. So I will stop sharing. Can I stop sharing? Where do you do? So with that, I think uh, I will uh, give the mic to my friend, Dr. Opiado, who is a, has a, had a brilliant academic career. He has a background of army where he was basically trained, but then he got a lot of experience in Australia where he has been you know, trained at the best centers. Currently, he is the CEO of National Heart Institute in New Delhi and is director of uh, uh, All India Heart Foundation, which is doing a lot of charity work. He has experience of more than doing 1,500 or 16,000 open heart surgeries and is a master in bypass surgery with total arterial revascularization. And amongst many, many awards, he's also received VC Roy Award. So he's going to talk about surgery continues to be the standard of care. Can I stop sharing my slides? Just a minute. Dr. Yadav, you can share the slides, can you? I shall, but the, your screen is taken by your slides, so will I be... Can I? Okay, now you can, okay? Yeah. Sure. Is that all right? Yeah, very well. Well, thanks a lot, Professor Call, and uh, 
Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. We just heard two absolutely brilliant, outstanding lectures by two authorities. I thoroughly enjoyed. But let me issue a caveat and don't get me wrong. Neither all that we heard was the gospel truth and nor all that I'm going to say from now onward going to be the holy grail. Let's be very clear. In this polarized world, we do have some element of turf protection and it's for you, the audience, to use your wisdom and erudition to choose the pearls. However, there are certain incontrovertible facts which are well entrenched in science but are not well appreciated by the clinicians. And I would like to enunciate three of those totally incontrovertible facts. Well, these were my disclosures, none related to this presentation. Now, fact number one is that coronary artery disease is a spectrum. And at the one end, you have an acute ST elevation MI, mortality generating. But at the other end, you have stable coronary artery disease, which may be multivessel, which hardly ever leads to death or MI. And as they say, a lot of people die in bed. Doesn't mean bed kill them. A lot of people will die with coronary artery disease. It's not necessary that the coronary artery disease kill them. So all blockages need not be treated. The fact too is that the medical treatment has so improved and it has been shown in the corner study that if you have a good compliance with the medical treatment, the mortality in stable coronary artery disease is the same as the general background population. The Kravich crossover showed there's no harm with initial OMT. The ischemia trial, the same finding, and a recent analysis by Sri Paul Bangalore, no survival benefit with intervention versus good medical treatment. Again, I repeat, in stable coronary artery disease. And a third fact has been impressed by Dr. Mehran as well as Dr. Cole. Diabetic patient is an altogether different ball game, microvascular dysfunction, small diffusely diseased arteries, chronic total occlusions, heavily calcified arteries, and all this has been spoken about. They have, you know, large necrotic core, high degree of inflammation, aggressive atherosclerosis. So all that I want to put across is that every single patient by default is a patient qualifying for medical treatment. And whenever we advise intervention, be it PCI, be it CABG, it should be done by design and not by default. Now, having said that, with that prologue, let me come to the matter at hand. The decision-making in CAD is not only dependent on the extent, it's also dependent on the symptomatic status. What is the LB function like, comorbidities, and the patient-related factors are very important. And lastly, the evidence base and the latest we have are the European guidelines. Now, the European guidelines very clearly state for diabetes mellitus, even with a syntax score of less than 22, PCI is a 2B indication. And when you look at three-vessel disease, then the recommendations are only without diabetes mellitus, where they have said that less than 22, PCI may be done, but more than 22, PCI is a level three recommendation. So by derivation, if a patient has diabetes, more than any syntax score, it is probably 2B and worse indication for PCI. However, the problem with syntax score is that though it predicts maize in PCI, it does not do that in cabbage. And therefore, it has been found in the Freedom Study that syntax score should not be utilized to guide the choice of coronary revascularization. And when I see the syntax score, I mean the anatomical syntax score. So the clinical syntax score, looking at the clinical profile, and the, and the functional syntax score, looking at the physiological uh, stenosis, that is FFR study, were introduced. The FFR, again, informs PCI but has not been shown for the same for CABG. The Fargo trial showed that the results are exactly the same and the, they commented to quote, FFR is not better than angiography to guide, uh, to, to guide CABG. 
Same thing happened in a meta-analysis of FI trial where FFR-guided CABG did not improve graft patency and did not prove, uh, uh, give improved outcomes. So the graffiti trial is the currently ongoing RCT looking at CAG, the cine angiography driven and FFR driven CABG and those results are very keenly awaited. Now there are two very pithy issues which we must address. First, does diabetes becomes different in non-insulin versus insulin dependent diabetics? A number of studies have shown that early outcomes are not affected by diabetes. And the same was shown by a recent analysis by Kogan, where there was no difference in early MACE between non-diabetics and diabetics, and there was no difference between NIDDM and IDDM. Not only MACE, even in-hospital mortality was exactly the same. However, when they looked at the long-term five-year and 10-year mortality, both in diabetics versus non-diabetics, as well as IDDM versus NIDDM, it was worse in diabetics. And you can see the blue line, which was no diabetes, had a better survival than the diabetes patients. And insulin-dependent diabetes, which is the yellow line, did worse as compared to NIDDM patients. The same was also found in a meta-analysis of 11 trials, where the all-cause mortality was almost one and a half time, and even the cardiac mortality was higher in diabetic patients. But for as many studies which show that the long-term mortality is adversely affected by diabetes, we have equally important studies which say long-term mortality is exactly the same if proper diabetic treatment is used. And there, 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 there are a lot of confounders. Why these studies are differing is because of the factors like insulin therapy. Now, insulin we know is a pro-inflammatory uh, agent itself. It increases the hepatic synthesis of cholesterol. HPA1C alters the outcomes. And, you know, drugs, as Dr. Call just referred to, may also alter these outcomes. Even the clinical presentation may change the outcomes, as was shown by this study just published a couple of weeks back, which is a propensity score matched analysis of a Korean registry, where if the patient has stable coronary artery disease, eight-year maze between PCI and C, which you are absolutely equivalent. But if the patient presented with non-STEMI ACS, then CABG was better than PCI. Then also it depends on what grafts have been used in CABG. Arterial grafts, they are, the patency is not affected by diabetes, but cephalous vein graft are very significantly affected by the diabetes. Also, as Dr. Mehran referred to, Insulin-dependent diabetes, if you use bilateral memories, then the incidence of deep sternal bone infection goes very high, 5 to 7%, especially if the patient is obese or has chronic obstructive airway disease. Therefore, the European guidelines have recommended that all diabetics must have skeletonization of the IMA. Now, that's a technical thing in which you take out the intermemory artery without its adjoining vena comitentes, lymphatics, fat, fascia, everything you leave behind and you just take out a skeletonized IMA and it is given a class one recommendation for diabetics, especially if you're using bilateral IMAs. Then there have been certain iterations in CABG. Now, off-pump results in India have been excellent, you know. The degree of revascularization have been same and our early mortality have been very, very salutary. In fact, even with use of bilateral IMAs in experienced mm -hmm. hands, if you look at the Leipzig experience, you find 10 year survival rate is almost 80%, and deep sternal wound infection is down to under 1%. Also, if you do a no touch technique, and what we call an aortic CABG, in which if you use a Libarima Y, don't use a cross clamp on the aorta, don't use a side by turn aorta, then the 30 days CVA is in fact less than the CVA with PCI in the syntax trial. So that's the kind of results that you can achieve with the modern techniques in CABG. Even minimally invasive CABG is coming off its own. Though the guidelines give class 2 a recommendation only for Lima to LAD, 
but currently the mist trial which is comparing minimally invasive or cystinotomy multi vessel cabg is going on and the results are expected early next year and that probably is going to revolutionize this field now coming to direct head to head comparison of trials of cabg versus pci and diabetics the most trials have clearly demonstrated that there is improved survival with cabg even but however bangalore analysis which took place in uh, 2015 which uh, both the uh, speakers previously referred to no mortality benefit was uh, was 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 found with cabg but the follow up was only 3 years we have two more recent meta analysis by dietol and by shinetol where also cabg failed to demonstrate any mortality benefit but then again the follow up was very less and as michael forco commented to quote you need at least 4 to 5 years before the mortality signals emerge and that is why the freedom follow on study is important the all cause mortality with pci if you look at a median follow up of 7 and a half years was 24% versus 19% and these curves they are not flat as here they are not parallel they diverge at around one and a half two years but at eight years they are diverging and as we move forward this survival advantage is going to increase and if you look at the forest plot you know all clinical situations virtually any and every clinical situation cabg scores far superior to pci in the east have multi registry and uh, pooled analysis uh, data also coming from the sts and the uh, the national cv database which looks at the real world scenario and if you look at the real world scenario the five year mortality of pci was 28% versus 18 with cabg and british columbia in in canada exactly look at looked at the generalizability of the freedom trial that was their primary endpoint and they found that the mortality with pci was significantly higher so the results of the freedom trials are certainly generalizable to real world the the, the early outcomes certainly stroke were higher with 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 cabg and that favored pci but if you look at five year data even the stroke was neutralized and dr call referred to the syntax trial stroke now that was higher stroke with cabg in intention to treat analysis lot of patients waiting for cabg got strokes so when the syntax trial was the incidence of stroke was looked at as as treated analysis there was no difference between cabg and pci even in the syntax trial the sweet heart and i can go ad nauseum head at all a meta analysis of the 11 trials should try at all a meta analysis of 16 studies you have you know almost 70% increase mortality with pci increase mi two times repeat revascularization two and a half times and this analysis by a neutral authority in epidemiologists from imperial college again the freedom plot against all clinical situation favors cabg and when we have comorbidities for example elbow dysfunction a very recent trial by nagendran you look at the difference between the survival get exaggerated from the freedom study when we look at elbow dysfunction and same thing is when chronic kidney disease is present cabg performs better now that is my current slide we have been talking of all new stent platforms and how they're going to change things let's trace the evolution of stent technology we go back to 2005 and you had newer anti platelets come in you had newer generation of stents come in you had newer imaging technologies ffr you had the oct introduced the ivs introduced but as you move forward you realize that the red line which is the all cause mortality with pci has never followed never fallen below that of the cabg never even matched it and the the the, the graphs are 
are, are, are widening. And that's why in an editorial very recently, Dumansky said that better stents alone will not change the superiority of CABG. And as Professor Mehran Husser told, that the premise is different. PCI addresses a focal lesion, CABG addresses a whole segment which can produce future spontaneous MI. Now, there are two very important issues which are not addressed and which new stent technology will not change. One is the degree of completeness of revascularization. Now, in New York multi vessel PCI registry, there was more than 70% incomplete revascularization in a huge database of 40,000 cases. And even if you use the FFR based uh, study, you find almost 30% of the patients get incomplete revascularization, and this increases the two year maze. So that the new stent technology will not address. And that is why the European guidelines say, when considering the decision between CIPG and PCI, completeness of revascularization should be prioritized, and that's a high level of recommendation. So do I mean to suggest that PCI has no role? No, absolutely, that nothing can be further from truth. PCI has a very, very definitive and very salutary role, but in limited subset of patients. In primary PCI, all situations, acute MI, ST elevation, PCI is numero uno, no question. Small amount of myocardium in jeopardy, focal simple lesions, low syntax scores, certainly PCI. Surgically prohibitive mortality or high risk, PCI. And as a part of hybrid uh, strategy, PCI has a great role. And I will end, ladies and gentlemen, quoting from this famous, very important trial, the tuxedo himself, Professor Cole says, challenging CABG is unjustified. And if that be so, ladies and gentlemen, may I request you not to increase the army of PCI victims, especially the diabetic patients. Thank you, Professor Paul. Good. Great. Expected. Unexpected lines, Opie. Very nice. <laughs> Thank you. You call spade a spade. <laughs> okay, okay. So I think we still have some time, and uh, this has been an exciting time. First of all, you know, let me put uh, forward a question each to Roxana and to Dr. O.P. Yadav. Roxana, in your practice, what is the kind of multivessel disease you would uh, recommend bypass surgery without any hesitation? And of course, it's how you put to the surgeon. Uh, hard teams are always there, but it's also very important what you feel about it, and then you have to convince the surgeon. And he, with your towering personality, you can convince anybody. So, Roxana? Well, I mean, I think uh, in, in any decision making that we as clinicians make, it's a risk benefit uh, that we have to be very honest with our patients, taking into account their uh, baseline risk factors as well as their anatomical factors. Um, I think one of the big issues that we see in diabetic patients is that their distal targets are usually yeah. not that great. And, and while we are all for the best possible results, we must understand that in the real world, those types of patients never get mm -hmm. randomized in clinical trials for which we don't have a lot of answers to. So when the distal targets are not good, when the patient has high risk for surgery, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm more reluctant to send that patient to surgery. But when there is good distal targets, multivessel disease, bifurcation disease, and some diffuseness of the disease, I really want to, and, and a syntax score that's high, and there's low risk of um, stroke, and I have a really excellent surgeon with a great pair of hands, then of course, I want to go to my surgical colleagues. So it is a really such an important team approach. And the patient is part of that team. Um, and uh, it's really nice for them to hear the risk benefit with both the surgeon and the interventionalist present together as they're talking to the patient. Because what happens most of the time, everyone is talking to the patient in silo and the patient becomes very confused. Every patient who's given an, a, an offer of a a quick procedure and going home and back to work 
is going to choose that procedure. I think it's really important to give them the long-term impact of what that choice means um, and that maybe it's a longer recovery, but a better outcome down the line or vice versa. Uh, so I think those are the kinds of things that I basically put into the equation and I discuss it with the patients. And no matter what we decide as far as the revascularization um, modality, uh, the background medical therapy is just so very important. And we as uh, proceduralists, Uh, are not done when the procedure is finished. And we really have a responsibility to our patients and to the medical community at large to really follow up and make sure that they're receiving optimal medical management, that they're getting to goal, that they're dieting and exercising, the hemoglobin A1C is in the five range, not in the eight range, that the uh, high blood pressure is well controlled into the numbers that we like to see, Uh, that the LDL is below 70, maybe even below 50, um, and there's no smoking. I mean, those are really uh, important in that there's daily exercise and good food, plant-based diet. If we don't do those things, then we're not really good doctors. So uh, hopefully we could could get that. Thank you. Thank you for your very honest opinion, and which I really appreciate. Uh, OP, what about patients which we often see in our milieu, triple vessel disease and, you know, diffuse disease, distal targets, not very good. What do you do? Do you plan endartectomy in them or, uh, you know, and they're symptomatic means uh, you are not able to manage their symptoms on medical treatment very well. Well, okay. Uh, <clears throat> that was the first thing that, look, ideally, if we can somehow get them onto uh, optimal medical treatment, get them into a first, you know, uh, lifestyle, then I would probably leave them alone. Now, having said that, two things I want to drive home, which is a myth. One is that these patients, as the targets go worse, we tend to offer them more saphenous vein revascularization, thinking that they're going to be, you know, less risky revascularization. Worse the target, greater is the need for arterial revascularization. A good LED 2.5 millimeter and above with a tight stenosis, even vein will remain open for 15 years. But if it is a diffusely diseased vessel, it needs an arterial graft. So in these patients, arterial grafts are mandatory. And even if you can't get the second mammary because of some reason, use the radial artery. Use the gastrobiploic artery. And we have two radial arteries. Secondly, end arterectomy is extremely important and uh, the current new techniques that we, it's a technical thing. We do endarterectomy, which is by a technique traditionally called closed endarterectomy. means we make a very small one centimeter arteriotomy and put certain special probes and take out a whole core, uh, bore a core of atherometrous material and take out. Now this closed endarterectomy results are very poor in these patients, we should do what is called open endarterectomy, where the whole artery is laid bare, six, seven, eight centimeter, and then lay an only patch of vein on which you put an arterial graft. So those are the two aspects. Give them arterial grafts and do open endarterectomy. Even diffuse disease can be tackled. Great. Uh, Dr. Talukdar has asked a relevant question that how often is this bilateral skeletonized uh, memory drafts taken uh, in your experience or in the national uh, experience or whatever you think it is, which is very good, very impressive. Yes, it's certainly a very valid and I'm hang my head in shame when I say as a surgeon, less than 5%. And that's a big shame. And the reason is that, and we've been pleading that this should be included as a quality matrix. It is never counted. We looked at mortality. We look at deep cellular wood infection. We look at hospital stay, but we never use what conduits have been used. And that should be an officially declared a quality matrix. And second thing is it should be reimbursed. 
If a surgeon takes bilateral memories or do, does total arterial revascularization, he's going to take three times or two times more time on the operating table. So neither the private sector, corporate hospitals allow the operating time for such long period that you do one case over seven hours, nor a doctor is willing. So this is very sad that that's happening. As far as personal experience, we tend to use bilateral IMAs in every patient less than 50 years of age. If the patient is more than 50, we go by Lima and radial artery, which is a default second conduit in upwards of 90% of our patients. Great. There's a question that what about the ethnic differences and you know racial differences? I think the Freedom Trial was uh, really bright in that. It was an international trial and uh, there were many Indian centers also. I was one of the investigators and there were several others. And if you see the complete list of names, you'll find two or three familiar names. So that kind of a trial when it is done is, uh, you know, everybody is there. Like talent study, which was done, it was completely a European population, but not an Indian population. Now, Tuxedo 2 we're going to do is an Indian trial. So it will be 70 centers, but Indians. So I think there are some data from the country because some people have a belief that South Indians have smaller arteries and Punjabis have a bigger arteries. All that will be evened out. So it's important because, you know, South Asians have, you know, more diffuse disease as we see it comes at a younger age. A relevant question, but I think the decision making is patient to patient, what the patient wants, as Dr. Roxana was saying that, you know, you have to talk to the patient, give him science or have, this is science saying, you will do better with this and make up your mind. So that is the way one has to be honest with the patient. And I think that's very important. Roxana, you have any comments on this? Unmute. No, I fully agree uh, with all of your um, excellent comments. I mean, I think, uh, you know, we're seeing more and more excellent stent technologies trying to approach uh, the best possible superiority outcomes, even on top of the best in class now, uh, especially designed for our diabetic patients. And I think this is going to be a very, very interesting, innovative approach. And then I think in combination with best medical management of these patients, we could preserve uh, the use of the Lima for a later stage, especially in our younger patients, so that we could at least give PCI a chance and then uh, put the patient in the best possible health they could be in preparation if they should or if they will need cabbage at a later date. I think that is sort of like how I think about it, um, but I'm still not convinced that we have the best stent technologies on board right now for our diabetic patients. So, you know, we're really in that moment where we need to test these uh, important questions. Good. Then one of my colleagues, uh, Varsha, is asking that, number one, is to surgeon that how often is bilateral and total revascularization done in diabetic patient population, uh, if Dr. Yadav has any impression in the country? Well, I told you it is less than 5%. Yeah. Less than 5%. And total arterial revascularization, I'm talking of more than two arteriograph data is available. There was a study which is, uh, came out from Hyderabad from Sajja et al. And they came out and uh, the analysis was done. The younger generation are reaching uh, age less than 40, uh, 12%. So they did older generation versus younger generation also. So this figure is going up. But more than two arterial grafts is two or more is what the data is. When you say total arterial in which not a single vein graft mm -hmm. is used, that figure is going to be abysmally yeah, low. Very low. Yeah, yeah. Then the other question is uh, regarding the very attractive abluminous stent and uh, what is uh, the feeling? I think the trial is still started and it's 3,000 patient trial. Roxana may be able to tell you better because she is uh, on the executive. Roxana? Well, the Ability DM uh, uh, study has begun enrollment. We've, um, you know, we COVID has slowed us down just like Tuxedo 2. Uh, we are, um, you know, but we're well underway. Uh, I think we have about 50 patients enrolled and starting back up again and, and are very, very excited about uh, the possibilities of uh, 
reaching the goal of uh, certainly showing um, both non-inferiority and superiority. Yeah. Then there are one or two questions uh, directed to me regarding Tuxedo 2 that uh, do you do everything in one go? Well, we have to be very careful with the contrast and uh, uh, very often the EGFR of these patients is compromised. So we don't uh, ask the people that you have to do it in the same go. You can have it in two goes and uh, those the goes should be within four weeks and not beyond that because uh, that is going to vitiate the results. That is one. And the other one is Tuxedo 2. Uh, what kind of antiplatelet or he said that we're randomizing to presogrel versus tacogrelor. I think that will also give some value. It's 1800 patients, so that will give us some value. Of course, uh, they're randomized and we do exclude elderly people with history of strokes and uh, lean uh, people who bleed more. They will not be uh, put in on that. But barring that, I think uh, it's fine. And uh, plus, you know, GLP-1 analogs are available now. Once in a week, injection is available. We have semaglutide, we have duraglutide. So that also will be, will be going to very real optimal medical treatment. So... Any other pressing questions? I don't see on the chat box and I think we have uh, discussed most of the things. So with that, I think I will pass on to uh, Raj Vinesh for his uh, concluding remarks. Uh, thank you, Dr. Paul. Uh, good evening, doctors. Uh, as we come to the conclusion of today's webinar, let me express my sincere thanks to Dr. Ruksana Mehran to Dr. Upendra Kaul and Dr. O.P. Yadav for such a wonderful and scrumptious academic feast. The academic progress of today's uh, deliberations were really enthralling and I'm sure it will be equally enriching for all the esteemed participants in their endeavor to offer better care to the patients. Let me also express my heartfelt gratitude to all the doctors who participated today for sparing your valuable time and being part of this program. Believe me, your participation has really illuminated this event. Doctor, we hope to you know, have much uh, more of these academic programs in future also. Let me also uh, say that, you know, hosting you physically for such kind of programs brings a little more of excitement but nevertheless, connecting to all of you, even if it is virtually, brings a lot of joy. So thank you once again. And wish for the safety of all of you, your families and your loved ones. Before you leave this program, I would request to you that there is a one format which is being displayed on your screens kindly share your feedback of today's program so that we bring all the improvement for the uh, no programs which we intend to have in future. Thanks once again. Good. Thank you very much. And I know Roxana has a very busy OPD and she has been gracious enough to, you know, give us this time. So have a nice day, Roxana. And then we have a evening now. We'll enjoy our evening. Thank you. Bye-bye. <laughs> Bye-bye. Offline, please, and stop recording.